What do you see as a stand-up here? Of course, you see me as a person. But the question I have is, what is the image you see of me? Do you see a woman coming from a country that's typically portrayed in Hollywood movies for its poverty? Do you see a woman who does not belong here? Do you see a woman with, as some would call it, no executive presence? What's the first image that comes to your mind? I'm going to pause and let you process that image. Powerful. <laughs> if any of that image popped up in your head first, well, congratulations. Like many others, your unconscious bias just played out. You experience the bias of intersectionality. Intersectionality, a term that was first introduced by Kimberly Crenshaw about 30 years back to explain the double bind oppression African American women felt. Crenshaw is credited with the introduction and development of the intersectional theory, in particular, intersectional feminism. Intersectional feminism explores the overlapping systems of oppression and discrimination that women face due to ethnicity, sexuality, and economic background. Intersectional feminism is also one of the topics that is most overlooked when it comes to diversity and inclusion initiatives in organizations. My most lived experience is at the intersection of race, gender, and class. Let me tell you a little story to illustrate. When my son was in kindergarten, we moved apartments. We had just bought a new apartment. And as is customary here in the Swiss schools, the address change was sent out to all parents. The next day, as I walked my son to the kindergarten, a mother walked up to me with a bag full of old clothes and used groceries. She handed it over to me and said, I completely understand your financial situation, and that you had to move apartments because you cannot afford the current one. So whatever I can help, here are some old clothes and groceries. She saw me at the intersection of race and class. Now, switching gears to the corporate world, the organization that I was working for in 2014 was acquired by an American corporate giant. There was a lot of frenzy in the organization about how the Americans would come and cut jobs. Everyone was looking for a new job, while managers were looking to put together new teams. I, too, got a call from one of the hiring managers. I asked, what's the role? And he asked me back, why do you care? Of course, I do care what I do 8 hours, 10 hours, 12 hours a day. <laughs> and then his answer made me freeze, literally freeze in that moment. He said, why do you care what you do? You should care about having a job to keep your work permit. You surely do not want to go back to where you came from. <laughs> he saw me at the intersection of gender and race. I can cite several examples, some of which the women here as well can relate to. I've been asked to fetch coffee. I'm sure pretty much everyone would have been asked to fetch coffee. I've been asked to take notes. And I've been looked at as a junior most person in meetings I have chaired. The intersection of race, gender, and class. Now, all of you might argue, well, these are your experiences, great. How does the numbers look on a larger scale? I've been researching these numbers in corporate Europe for over a decade now. Even in preparation for this talk, I wanted to come with some numbers so that it's not just my lived experience. Numbers such as, what's the percentage of women of color in corporate Europe? What's the percentage of women in management positions? At the least, what's the number of women of color who are CEOs in corporate Europe? I'm rather appalled to say that we still do not have these numbers for corporate Europe. We work with the data from US, as we all know, is not representative for Europe. Nonetheless, let's take a look at the numbers from the US. There is a declining representation of women as we go along the hierarchy in corporates in the US. 
17% to start with at entry levels to a meager 4% when it comes to C-suite. Compare it only the management positions. 32.6% is occupied by white women against 11.4, again a meager percentage when it comes to women of color. Challenges to determining inequities at the intersection of race and gender exist across all European states due to lack of available data. So what does it leave us with? That leaves us with no data to baseline and therefore unable to track the progress of women. While I strongly believe that racial, racial equity at the workplace cannot be achieved without breaking systemic biases, institutional biases that exist in corporate, we will also continue to traumatize and drive away women of color from corporates before we fix the broken system. And COVID pandemic has been a testimony to that. September 2020 data, again from the US, show us that 1.1 million people left the corporate workforce. Close to 80% of that were women. More than 50% of that were women of color. And now I'm going to use an analogy. Let's take the group here and imagine all of you were women of color. How many of you would be unemployed? 30 of you would be unemployed against 16 of you if all of you were white women. So question now is what now? Is there a way for us to help women of color and generally people at the intersections stay and thrive in the workplace before we fix the broken system? Well, the good news is the answer is yes. There is a middle ground and that is us as individuals. First, for women of color at the intersections, how can we navigate a corporate landscape that is generally reluctant and resistant to acknowledge and therefore act on the biases. I would start with first, leverage the power of conversations. Conversations are a powerful tool when it comes to coping mechanisms. For long I have believed that I have been singular, I am alone in my experiences, my perception of realities and the microaggressions I face at work. I was always made to feel that I am complaining and I was constantly asked to accept fitting in every time I spoke up. As the racial inequity started taking a toll on my mental health, I decided to reach out to other women of color. Recognizing that women of color and generally women experience some of these biases normalized my feelings. Suddenly I was not alone. Each of us have a different response to a same situation and learning from the coping mechanisms of others have been a great source of strength for me. This has also been a guiding force for me to start a conversation group here in Europe for immigrant women who are constantly made to feel that they do not belong and help them find coping strategies to navigate the workforce. Leverage the power of conversations. Second, walk away from places and people you have outgrown. Have you ever shrunk yourself to fit in somewhere? If your answer is yes, this is a societal conditioning for positivity. Our brains work a way to find something that is positive to help us stay in places we have outgrown. Growing up in India, the population of 1.4 billion people was both a curse and a blessing. The blessing was that the opinion of one 10, 100, or a whole village of 40,000 people did not matter because you still had the rest of the 1.4 billion people's opinion to work with. <laughs> we are in a moment of awakening, thanks to COVID. Well, historically, we have fit our work into our lives. COVID pandemic has taught us that it is not only important, but also possible that can, we should and we can fit work into our lives. With the growing scarcity of talent across the world and across industries, have the courage to walk away from places and people you have outgrown. Third, be unique and remain unique. For as long as I can remember, I've been, a diversity, I've been looked at as a diversity hire. 
double diversity hire, as some would call it. <laughs> Even today, I'm someone who looks good in pictures. I tick two boxes of diversity targets, gender and race, and I'm generally different from the people in the normal workplace. This also means that being different, I'm constantly struggling to fit in, constantly trying to fit in, wanting to be liked, and thereby losing the authenticity. We are all unique. We all have our strengths and our unique skill sets. Even when we are looked at as diversity highs, the truth is we have earned that seat at the table. Own it, flaunt it, and leverage it. I grew up being part of a privileged group of people, the majority. Moving out of my home country suddenly made me minority. Being a minority has made me more empathetic, understand the power of diversity of thoughts, and most importantly, has enabled me to use my privileges to help people who do not share the same privileges. This has been possible only because of my unique life experiences, and most importantly, remaining unique. Last but not the least, a call for action for all of you who are allies and who want to be allies. Women of color do not have the same life experiences. They definitely do not have equal opportunities. And therefore, they do not share the same confidence levels. Allyships alli alleviates the systemic biases within corporates. I can tell you, I could not have navigated 20 years of corporate life with a strong allies, both men and women, who have created that support system for me and who have created the opportunities for me. So the question is, how can all of us, all of you, be allies? Simple acts such as speaking up when a woman of color is being talked over in meetings is such a powerful tool. Don't be afraid of the word privilege. Don't be ashamed of the word privilege. Privilege is not something that is bad or negative. Privilege can be used as an important resource to break down biases. Privilege can be used to build strong allyships at the workplace. All of us, all of you can be allies. All of you can help break the bias. All of you have the power to see me as who I am. And now I ask you again, what is the image you see of me?